Ladies and gentlemen, good uh, afternoon. I'm Machim Benman. I'm the Director for Strategic Partnerships of the Geneva Grad Institute. I welcome you to... It's not working? Uh, perhaps I need to go closer? Perfect. I, uh, no, I, I won't swallow. Welcome to uh, this, this briefing um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the new research paper that was produced by the Geneva Grad Institute, Paying for Multilateralism, Taking Stop on the Financing of International Organizations in uh, Geneva. Um, when uh, the Grad Institute is being asked simple questions by some of our core partners, in this case the, the the, the Republican State of Geneva on the question, very simple questions of uh, who are the main donors allowing international Geneva to work and thrive and how has their support evolved over the last two decades. When we received this question in late 2021, uh, we thought answering this question really requires a somewhat more systematic uh, research approach. And um, we, we looked in-house to see who, who can do the work, and we found a, a, a fantastic group, uh, one PhD student and a, a former student of the Grad Institute. And uh, not only the study that you have in front of you is, in fact, an innovation in methodological terms, but it also is a reflection of, uh, of how we can use through research produce a, a greater degree of transparency about the issue of financing of, of, of multilateralism, which is, of course, all information that contributes to the emerging discussion on the multilateralism for the future and, of course, the summit of the future, which will take place in New York later this year. Um, thank you for making time to, uh, to being at this briefing. Um, usually, we do not want you to be glued to your phones or computers as we, uh, as, we, uh, as we have briefings, but as the document is only an electronic PDF, feel free to download it on your phone and, uh, and, and consult it as you, as you see the presentation. We printed out a few copies out, out there, including also, of course, the, uh, the Geneva Policy Outlook uh, to 2024 that includes other very relevant uh, pieces of, of, of uh, an analysis. This event is being co-organized on the one hand by the Geneva Grad Institute, but also the Geneva Policy Outlook, which is a, a strategic partnership initiative of the Grad Institute with the support of the, the Canton, uh, as well as the City of Geneva and the Fondation pour Genève, which allows us, in fact, to uh, have an ongoing conversations about the question how Geneva has to adapt in the periods of rapid change. This study is surely one element uh, in this discussion. Uh, talking about money always makes discussions very concrete. And in what direction we can take uh, this, uh, the further evolution of this discussion, we can discuss after we have heard the principal finding. Um, Livio uh, Müller, welcome. Thank you very much for all your work, and we're looking forward to uh, a briefing of the key findings of the report. And thank you again for being here. Livio, please. Oh, I think you took my notes. You took my notes with you? Ah, you cannot do without them. <laughs> wow. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Mr. Olivier Couteau and the City and Canton of Geneva for entrusting us with this task. Thank you, Achim Weyman and Gabriel, who I cannot see here, up there, from the Geneva, Geneva Policy Outlook, who provided key insights along the way. And also, Lena Rieder Menge, who in the last week was really going the extra mile to make this happen. Uh, OK, we are all here to talk about money. Uh, what money? Well, the money of 16 Geneva-based international organizations over the last 21 years, not the last, so since 2000 to 2020, from about 1,150 different funders, which encompasses 30,000 payments. But before I go to the findings, I'll do what I always do when I get a new study, which, which is skip to the methodology. Uh, I'll bore you a little bit, uh, because I want you guys to trust me and understand what we're actually grasping here when I show you trends. So which organizations are we talking about? These are the 16 organizations we selected. Uh, it was a list developed in conversation with the Canton. 
what this list is based on is, number one, organizations with headquarters agreements in, in West Switzerland, number two, with staff above 500, and number three, a few other smaller organizations that we thought would be important to pick it in so we could have uh, a view of specific field. So you can see already from the get-go that, for instance, WIPO, WEF, uh, and IOM have very different ways of funding ourselves, right? WEF relies on memberships. WIPO might rely on uh, intellectual property, while IOM relies on assessed and voluntary contributions. So uh, there is a, a mix of organizations there with different types of funding, uh, which will allow, allow us to say certain things, but not other things. Number two, we also have a good uh, mix of organizations in the humanitarian sector and in the global health sector, which allows us maybe to think about those two uh, sectors a little, bit, a little bit more generally. Uh, methods, so how did we do that? So uh, we have 16 organizations, 21 years. This gives us, so to say, a sample frame uh, with 312 combinations of years organizations. Some of them only appear later. For each one of these little corners, what we had to do was collect financial data. So in the perfect world, I would actually go to these organizations, get their bank accounts, open up their UBS bank account, whatever, and try to get transaction level data, right? But nobody would let me do that. Uh, so we had to figure out an alternative way of going about this. And there are a few different problems because there is no common standard to report donations across the UN system. Of course, there are accounting standards, but this is being reported at an aggregate level. The way they report earmarked funding, assessed contributions, voluntary contributions might vary from organization to organization. Uh, so we had to do something. For each one of these little squares, we opened their annual reports, we went into their websites, we went into their financial statements, uh, and we, we try to understand what sort of information are they giving us. So WHO, for instance, from 2000 to 2004, was giving us what we called <laughs> was giving us what we called very granular information. So they tell us Switzerland gave us this much in this year. We have a name, we have the year, we have the value. Uh, however, other organizations would give us information that I call partially granular. They would tell, tell us things like a public donor gave us this much. Some, some organizations don't have any data at all uh, for certain years. Finally, we also uh, need to think about, okay, once IOM tell us Switzerland gave us this much, is this one donation by Switzerland, or are they compiling donations and, amount and telling us that total amount? Unclear. We talk to a few people doing reporting, it depends a lot. So what we end up getting is nominal USD donations for each year, in each organization, for about 80% of these 3,000 payments I told you, we have a name of the donor, we have a nominal amount in USD, they report normally in USD, two years after, so we're, we're getting data from 2000 only in 2002, so if I went to the annual reports now, I would only find data for 2022, 2023. So we are always working with data from a little bit behind. For each one of these squares, uh, we, when we could automate the process, we automated. So image recognition software is web scraping. When we could not do that, we had to manually extract information. So we did that. There's a lot of possibilities of human error. So then we tried to do a few analysis, look for outliers. Anyway, we tried to be sure that there's no human mistake in there. Uh, I'll go to the findings. I'll show you a few plots. Uh, just a little note. When I show you trends a long time, you can see, for instance, that the global fund didn't exist in 2000 and 2001. So when, you, when I so show you a line a long time, it might be that I'm not starting at the year 2000 because I want to be sure that the trends we see reflect the numbers of organ reflect the actual money and not that in certain years I have more or less organizations. Let's go. Uh, this is a broad overview: nominal donations since 20, 2002. <coughs> How much money we found? Or the big question: We found 250 billion. Nobody's surprised, this is good. I'm always afraid somebody will be like, this is very off. Uh, $250 billion, uh, increasing a long time nominally, uh, quite strongly. So at the first year, we found $4 billion. At the last year, 2020, we had $23.6 There's a steady increase. Um, 
that dampens. It goes a little bit slowly after 2008. This is most likely because of the financial crisis. We're going to talk about this in a little bit. Private donations, this is the red part of the curve you see there, were about 3.5% about of annual donations at the beginning, and they end up reaching 10% in the late 2010. So there is a little bit of an increase. Let's put this a little bit in perspective so we, we can start discussing the, the big questions, right? Uh, 250 billion for the mission of these organizations, is it too much, isn't it? I'm not sure we can discuss. Uh, yearly NHS budget is 170 billion. Uh, Bolsa Familia, the Brazilian policy, flagship policy to reduce poverty is 30 billion a year. One last figure, World Food Program gets alone 14 billion a year. So we can discuss whether the portfolio size fits the mission that Geneva has. Let's look at donors. If I get all this data from all years and cluster them, I group them by donor, these are the top 15 donors. First obvious finding is that the main donors are Western countries. And then we have two, three different little things there. We have the European Union appearing as a supranational organization. We have the UN and the Gates Foundation. The Gates the Gate Foundation is the only private actor that appears in this list uh, with about 3.5% of the donations. There are another 860 private funders in the data set. And if you only look at these donations, um, Gates alone is responsible for 60% responsible for of the money we found from private actors. So it is a little bit of an interesting unbalance, unbalance in there. We can also compare this with uh, overall UN budget. I take a look at the numbers in the General Assembly. The US donated in 2022 18 billion to the UN. This is a third of the UN budget according to UN General Assembly. So Geneva might be slightly less reliant in the US than overall um, UN. Finally, uh, what I can tell you is that if you look at each one of these donors uh, a long time, you're going to find a little bit of what I show in the big curve. The financial crisis uh, has a little effect in dampening the curve. Euro crisis also affects a little bit uh, European countries. I did a little bit more to find this out, but I'm not going to go into the details here. And finally, there are also a few country-level factors that define donations. For example, I love this one, Marja Carta Las Geneva, Empty Promises or Policy Shift. Um, we noticed that Australia had a noticeable decrease in donations. And we went looking, OK, what could explain that? And we found out that P uh, Prime Minister Tony Abbott, back in 2015, had uh, a policy shift. He wanted to do multilateralism uh, elsewhere. We, we find this effect a little bit in there. Uh, is there a Trump effect? Well, uh, there's a recent study that really looks into Trump. They say that the main thing that Trump did was more, he cut budget from certain places. So if you're with the WHO, very likely you, there is a Trump effect for you, but not in our organizations. And what they also find in this study, uh, which we could not test because of the time range, is that once Joe Biden returned to office, donations reverted to the previous levels. Uh, a word of... A word of assurance, well, a little problem here is also that we know from research that first mandate presidents are normally very constrained by red tape. A second mandate might be very quick and very easy for him to dismantle financing through all the thing. Um, let me see what, I have, what, I, what else I have here. Ah, yeah, Brexit effect. Um, we wonder if there was a Brexit effect. We don't find a very strong one, but that's also because Brexit kicks in in 2020, officially, and some of this money is sticky, right? As such contributions in the UN might be sticky. So there, perhaps there is a Brexit effect in the future, yet to find out. Let's look at recipients um, and think about that public-private relationship that I showed at the beginning. Here, it unpacks a little bit unevenly. WEF is the obvious outlier in our little sample. Of course, they rely on private memberships. But we can also uh, put this in contrast when you look at the total value they're dealing with. We're speaking about 3 million per year, uh, whereas other organizations are already in the billions. Again, here, nominal USDs, right? Uh, Gavi and WHO are a bit exceptional because they consistently get uh, private money quite well. We're going to zoom into that in two or three slides. Uh, IOM also was a little bit interesting because they were more reliant on private money in the future and they managed to increase public contributions quite well. If we cluster these organizations by their mandates, this is health, humanitarian, 
labor, economics, and science, and peace, these are the mandates of International Geneva, we get this. So let me give you the gist very quickly. Within health, we have WHO, Gavi, DNDI, GRDP, and Global Fund. For the whole period of time, 107 billion. Humanitarian, OHCHR, UNHCR, ICRC, IOM, 100 billion. So right in there, you have a huge chunk of donations. Labor, economic, and science, you have ILO, WIPO, ITU, WEF, WTO, CERN, 33 billion. And finally, peace, only one organization, uh, UNOG, is 4 billion along the time. Of course, here the trends, they reflect the number of organizations, right? Way less organizations in peace. But the takeaway from this one is that while in the early 2000s, health and humanitarian, they were about 70% of the total money, now they are 90. It's becoming a little bit the, the main game in town, maybe, maybe. We're gonna, speak, we're gonna contextualize all of this. Uh, such a shift could be indicative of maybe two, two things. One is either the case that health and humanitarian organizations are particularly good in attracting money, or that the other ones are attracting less, so the budget shift could come from either size. Uh, what we find is that it's probably the, the case that health and humanitarian got more money than the others. Okay, um, quick look into global health. Once we were collecting this data, we noticed that one thing that happened with those, these organizations is that they are re-granting money among themselves more than other fields. And then we had the little idea of, you know, well, let's plot this as a network where each one of these arrows shows the, the thickness of the arrow reflects how much money is going around and the direction of the money. And we find out uh, that actually the, world, um, the United States, the UK, and Gates, Gates Foundations, they behave very similar in the way they donate. There's a lot of coordination. Might have something to do with the replenishment, for, uh, replenishment strategy that the Global Fund implements. And one of the things we notice that this might be a, it could be that this is one of the reasons why they get so much money. There's a lot of coordination that we don't find in similar size in other sectors, but everybody knows about this. Uh, finally, we can also zoom in in the humanitarian. Uh, very quick descriptive trend. There's one thing here that I want to highlight for you guys, which is there is a strong increase, nominal increase. And then when we look into the private donations, there's more fluctuation. We identified that UNH, UNHCR was pretty good in getting private money in the latest years. We were wondering whether there is a reason for that or not. Went on looking, and it seems like they are pretty. They have a pretty strong internal strategy of private sector funding uh, that they claim to be uh, the how do they fastest growing international private sector funding program in the world. Uh, which brings us to the conclusions, or what can you learn from all of this? Well. I'll start by very quickly summing up the findings. Five key takeaways from my side. First one is funding increase nominally, but the portfolio size for the mission might be too small. Uh, we can discuss if it is. I find it's a bit too small. I'm not saying that the money is spent efficiently. I'm saying that maybe more money would be better. Uh, number two, majority of donors are Western. Uh, but it could also be that non-Western donors are financing organizations elsewhere. It could be Rome, it could be New York, it could be Jakarta, it could be Nairobi. Uh, something to find out in the future. Number three, support by private actors is minimal and localized, but perhaps um, they are contributing more to NGOs in Geneva. Private actors, private foundations normally like more NGOs than governmental institutions. Number four, global health remains a distinct ecosystem when we look at it that way, and perhaps very successful because of coordination, could be. Number five, the humanitarian sector is also a recipient, could potentially increase private donations with the right strategy. Okay, this is summing up the whole thing. I'll give you, I'll let, I'll let the panelists discuss what this means for Geneva, but I wanna give you my two cents as an academic, as a person that tries to think methodologically about this which is the following. What we're doing here is a lot of description, right? I'm describing to you uh, these lines, why they go up, when they go up, when they go down, and that's the first step to go into explaining, right? Before we know they go up, and before we tell you why they go up and down, we need to know whether they go up and down, right? So this is the first step, this is description. Uh, we can think about reasons, we can hypo hypothesize about reasons, uh, and I pointed to some of these reasons here which I'm here calling macro-level political economic factors, growth, crisis. If you run a regression to predict country-level 
donations, growth uh, appears to be a good factor. Another one is political shifts, right? Uh, guys get elected somewhere, changes priorities. Congress changes. Congress has a hold of budgets. Budgets changes what happens here. Third one could be the salience of an issue. Climate change might be getting more money now. I don't know, possibility. For one is loss of credibility. But the thing here is that these factors, what they are doing is changing the size of the wallet of the donor, right? Now, how this, how this wallet is distributed is something else. You cannot change these factors. No, no project officer at IOM can stop an economic crisis so they get, he gets more money. So this is analytically at a level that we can do very little about. However, if we think about, OK, once this wallet is defined by whatever macro level factors that I just listed, Another thing is how you distribute the wallet. Or in other words, what are organizational level things that POs can do to get more money? And here, uh, I went into the literature a little bit. First finding is that there's not so much on that, but there's also a little bit on that. One thing that they find is that um, organizations that undergo external review, a recent study finds, are particularly good in getting money, causal design, good methods. One thing that I find in my research is that organizations that frame their mission in terms of science apparently also get more money. Uh, in any case, and that's why I thought this talk was very poised to fail, most people that are actually inside organizations getting money can think about many reasons that I didn't raise here. So if one day we were to sit down and try to raise hypotheses, I'm sure we would get a better picture of OK, how is this wallet distributed to end with? I guess from my side, that's it. Uh, thank you, everyone. There is a link to the report here. You can scan and read. You can run, write me questions. Uh, I think it's out there. Read the methodology. And thank you very much. <laughs>
what the, um, my colleagues in international organizations say, there is always a disproportion between the mandate and the expectations and the amount of money. But it's also the value. WHO is valued 6.8 billion for two years. There is a reason for that. The second point, I think your, your, your study shows very well that multilateralism is not synonymous with international organization. You put in the study Gavi and the Global Fund, which has private-public partnerships. They are not intergovernmental organization. And they've been more successful than some international organization in attracting funds. So multilateralism has been changing since the 90s. Um, and I think Geneva is a good terrain for this um, experimentation, in particular because Donors have a tighter control on the money than in WHO, for example, because um, entities like Global Fund and Gavi are financing institutions, so as you say, they move money much close to implementation. And third, because they can do things that international organizations cannot do, in particular innovative financing. They can act as market actors of the financial market, which the typical UN system organization just cannot do. So there's a number of reasons if you start digging a bit critically uh, among the organizations. And that explains also the constant uh, refrain about the uh, dysfunctional funding of organizations, again, like WHO, where at this point 20% come from assessed contribution, 80% come from voluntary contribution, very often earmarked. Why? Because multilateralism is no longer, in a way, the um, global public good is an abused term, but the uh, acting in the collective interest is very much dictated by national parliament. They want to see results from money, and is going towards almost like a subcontracting approach. Donors give money to WHO to do malaria programs in Somalia, and the, the accountability flows back, and it flows to the parliament of donors. So there is, there is a reason for that. Also mandates. The absolute amount has to be seen in the light of the mandates. Organizations like um, ILO, like WHO, like FAO, have in good part a normative mandate. Normative mandates are cheaper. Uh, and, but very important, uh, you convene experts, you do meetings, they are much, more, much cheaper than expensive field operations. So in a way also the, the amount of money and the funding has to be linked to the value given to this normative function that are very important for civil aviation, maritime safety, um, uh, medicines obviously, uh, and here too I think you need to uh, look more deeply in the difference between mandates. Uh, the funding trend among states. There was nothing surprising there. But in a future study, it would be interesting to look at individual countries. And I would mention one, China. China, I was looking at the assessed contributions of WHO, doubled its assessed contribution in six years. The only country that's done that. So that's not only a recognition of the uh, power of the economy, but it's a recognition of the multilateral political ambitions of China. And that makes a difference also in the future. It's a second contributor to WHO, bigger than Japan bigger than Germany. So corporate funding uh, in organizations like WHO is a very sensitive topic because there's always a fear, ambivalence, at corporate capture, uh, conflicts of interest, and so on. But in a, in a situation of uh, the cutting of the A budgets and so on, I think we need to look more creatively at corporate funding. I fail to see why uh, corporations uh, look at COVID. Uh, Moderna was a nothing before COVID. Uh, the capitalization is going through the roof. They are billions, trillions of dollars and they have global impacts. I fail to see why accountability and contribution to the multilateral system should not be attached to the financial success. The challenge is how to do it, because it may mean loss of control for governments. It may mean creating the kind of firewalls to prevent conflict of interest by making it less appealing to corporations. They want to see the labels attached to the contribution. So there's a lot of research, I think, and a lot of discussion to do about that. Uh, don't forget that um, corporate funding is not only cash, it's also in-kind. And sometimes the in-kind part is much more important than the cash part. For example, uh, big corporations could collaborate with WHO for clinical trials. They donate huge amount of medicine. These are, there's, a, there's a financial um, uh, dollar bill, if you want, attached to that. So there's, there's more than just cash. Finally, um, 
you mentioned the interorganization flows. That's a very interesting uh, argument, in particular in the health field. But that points also to this moving of multilateralism, almost like a service contracting model. For example, Gavi finances almost half of the immunization budget of WHO. It's incredible. Why? Because WHO performs normative functions that Gavi can use in its operational and financing activity. States could finance the immunization budget of WHO, but they let Gavi do it. And that's largely money coming from Gates. So there's almost like a division of labor, but it's like a service that WHO provides to Gavi. So multilateralism, in my view, is really moving towards this more targeted, almost subcontracting model. Finally, uh, we talk about global public goods. I think Akim mentioned it in your report. But global public goods, to me, is not compatible with the current system where everything depends on 18, 20 donors. Uh, it's incredibly vulnerable, uh, unpredictable. And global public good means everybody contributes. Uh, we went close to the discussion in the early uh, discussions about the pandemic agreement in WHO, because if you consider vaccines and this kind of, of, of um, health technology, global public good, and you need multilateral money, everybody should contribute, no, no matter what the level of development. Everybody should have a minimum percentage uh, put in a fund, in, invested in research, and so on. But it's interesting that that, that that conversation, that window of opportunity, closed very quickly. And we are back, in my view, to the traditional model of reliance on a small group of donors, including the new pandemic fund that is uh, funding also WHO. So these are some random considerations from a health perspective. I hope they can be useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan Luca. Gilles, what do you observe from the humanitarian sector? Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And, uh, I read this report with a lot of interest, and also uh, somehow I want to commend uh, the, the first the ID from the Canton, but also uh, those who executed the research. Because uh, in my uh, earlier days, I had to do a number of uh, data mining on how aid is allocated, where it comes from, where it goes, and it's uh, heavy lifting in terms of data mining. So, uh, Livio and, and colleagues, uh, congratulations. And I think what you bring to the fore is original because you look at uh, multilateralism and international Geneva by selecting some of the top or largest uh, organization in international Geneva and questioning how are they funded and how has it evolved over 21 years. So it's, uh, it's something that hasn't been done. In the past, what we have done was mainly to say how much Geneva, Switzerland benefits uh, through the purchase of goods and services, through taxes being paid, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, how finally it can be an argument for parliamentarians to say, well, after all, you know, it's a good investment not only for the sake of helping and supporting and contributing to international cooperation, but it's also uh, a good investment even for uh, ourselves. And that's uh, somehow how uh, you know you try to get uh, majorities or strong majorities in parliament in favor of, um, of, of aid uh, budgets. Uh, when I was looking at that, my first reaction as an economist is to say, OK, you look at the market for multilateralism and for multilateral services. So what is demand? What is supply? And the demand, basically, as an economist, is, is precisely the donors. The donors purchase the services of um, international, multinational, uh, uh, intergovernmental, or uh, international organizations. And uh, they expect them to provide services on their behalf, so they demand those services. And we see that it evolves uh, depending on how it goes. Now, what is supply? And there, uh, it, it's interesting because in the humanitarian sector, for example, uh, humanitarian organizations are the suppliers, so they do the annual appeals for funds. But the annual appeal for funds seem to bring what we call needs to the fore, and to say needs are increasing. And needs are not solvent. So in the needs of people who require assistance and protection, they cannot afford or not pay for it. And that's why they have needs. 
And then we try to translate this into appeals, and sometimes it's worrying to see the trend of seeing appeals not being responded to, funded, and, and I think it would have been interesting to see the evolution uh, over years of what are the appeals being done by these 15 organizations and how what percentage gets funded over time, and do we see a clear trend in terms of, 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 the, of the funding of uh, you know, the responses to these appeals of suppliers. Uh, I'd like to also mention, but you, you, have, uh, you have said it, uh, Gianluca, uh, it's a very mixed bag. Uh, for instance, my organization, the International Committee of the Red Cross, it's a highly vertically integrated organization that does everything from A to Z, meaning uh, you know, getting and doing the needs assessment and uh, doing the appeal and then running the operation by itself. And you have other multi-stakeholder partnerships who are mainly funders, and they collect money to then, you know, send it and distribute it primarily, I guess, to, to health ministries and uh, structures. So it's, uh, it's very varied. And this comes to, to the question that would be great to, to do more research. And you have started at the end of your presentation to do this, Livio, is to say, what are the hypotheses between your figures, what you showed us, and the health and strength of multilateralism and the health and strength of international Geneva? And as uh, Gianluca has rightly said, the normative uh, work uh, doesn't cost much. It's mainly people and salaries. If I take this to the ICRC, uh, funding uh, delegates to visit prisons is very cheap in comparison to bringing huge you know, airplanes and distribute food, of course. But it doesn't mean that uh, for if we want to look at the strength and functioning of multilateralism and international law, uh, funding is, is, a good, is a good indicator. So I think this is another area where uh, I think that it would be great to, to see uh, more in depth what is behind it uh, in, in more detail. Now, I think uh, something which doesn't come uh, as a surprise but is clear is this concentration on public funding from Western OECD countries. And uh, in a sense, it is worrying that we don't see more uh, step uh, gradual diversification as we see emerging economies having emerged and now being, uh, you know, between uh, uh, upper middle income and high income economies with, uh, you know, uh, having, um, counting for ever greater share of, uh, of the world's GDP. And there, uh, there is a question, I think, of uh, universalism, because a lot of the organization that you have shown promote uh, and, and try to defend universal um, international treaties and uh, universal values. But uh, when you see the funding and the support for multilater multilateral organization in charge of implementing it, it, re it begs the question of how much do we have a consensus around these uh, universal objectives to be funded via multilateral organizations. And uh, an issue that I think we have very much uh, in conversations between uh, the, the so-called West and the so-called rest, sometimes is the question of whether it's a, it's a universalism that is imposed bottom up, uh, top down, or whether it's really a horizontal uh, uh, universalism with conversation on how it is actually uh, understood, practiced, and promoted. And I think there we need uh, much more uh, capacities, and International Geneva is ideally placed, I think, among other hubs to really bring this, uh, these difficult conversations uh, that are key to attract a greater diversification of funds when we come to the private sector, uh, it's true you could have taken, for instance, MSF as a case in point, and MSF, broadly speaking, 90% of their budget is funded by private uh, people, especially individuals, and uh, I think it's good because it shows the strength of a 
widely, uh, you know, uh, widespread social network of support for humanitarian medical uh, action uh, of MSF. Uh, so you have different, uh, but MSF is certainly an outlier, one of the outlier in this regard, but it would be interesting to see also how this evolves uh, over time and how come, you know, it's maybe less than the WHO Gavi and uh, concentrated on, on one foundation, but rather uh, uh, the expression of, uh, of bro a broader uh, societal support. Um, maybe one uh, last comment uh, before I conclude. Uh, uh, the sectoral allocation, at least what I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, increase in health and humanitarian, in the humanitarian sector, it does reflect the fact that, uh, you know, humanitarian, humanitarian action was about 3% of um, foreign aid with large by the end of the Cold War. Nowadays, it's possibly 12, 12, 14 percent. So the share of humanitarian aid within official development assistance has grown a lot, while the, the, the total cake has also grown somehow. But it's, uh, it just reflects the fact that there are ever more countries that are conflict affected and in crisis, ever more countries that happen to be uh, sanctioned jurisdiction where development actors cannot or can hardly operate fully, and that the needs to respond to uh, the plight of people living in these, uh, you know, conflict and, and fragile and conflict-affected environment has grown a lot. And uh, at the same time, we have seen that not many conflicts have been resolved and ended, uh, and uh, that we have seen a certain paralysis. That being said, and this will be my conclusion, I think we know today that those major donors are facing uh, very tight uh, budgetary constraints. Uh, very volatile uh, budgetary decisions, especially with regard to funding multilateralism, that uh, parliaments are, are split, and uh, that planning for, I guess, WHO, but at least planning for humanitarian organization, what should be the, 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 you know, the budget that we should aim for next year, becomes uh, more difficult than it used to be because of the volatile environment in which we are, but we know it's a constrained environment where because of budget deficits, because of priorities that go towards certainly security and defense and, and other uh, priorities, we see uh, that the, the funding uh, might rather uh, be constrained. And that's where uh, diversifying funding sources, but also doing better within the organization you have shown in terms of being more efficient, effective, but also uh, synergetic in the way we work is absolutely of the essence. So it will be a mix of efforts to try to really come to grip with uh, this diversification of uh, support, uh, supporters, which is not only important for funding purposes, but it's also for political support and ownership. And then this has to be coupled with, I think, uh, all of us uh, in, the, in the multilateral sector be really top-notch in uh, terms of efficiency, effectiveness, and, uh, and trust. And by the way, I, I'm sorry, I will have to leave maybe five minutes before, so uh, it's not that I don't want to stay, but uh, I, I'm sorry for that. Thank you very much, Gilles. I think it gives a lot of food for thoughts uh, for Livio and Remu for expanding this research. Before we open up for questions from the audience, I'll let you react maybe, Akim, on what uh, Gianluca and Gilles just mentioned. Thank you so much, Lena. And I'll be brief because I can just say, read the commentary of the report. But I nevertheless wanted to highlight uh, one or two elements uh, to bring the discussion back on the, on the, on the more macro level after having just heard the, the commentaries from the humanitarian and health field. Um, the first point connecting to what you just said, Gilles, is in fact, well, with all this increase and constant increase, well, all this cr discussion on crisis of multilateralism is, is perhaps a little bit uh, unreal. But then if we think that the increases has occurred in the humanitarian field and in the health field, it, this increase is also reflective of a, of a, of, of a world in crisis. Uh, that exactly the type of sectors uh, where, which, are, which, are, which are representative of a world in crisis are being funded by more actors. 
Uh, whereas the, the peace and uh, the social economic dimension stay relatively stable, as we have just seen. So this is one, one, one starting reflection. One other, one other point I, I feel, think is very important is to emphasize in the study that we are looking at a subset of actors, a very important subset. And there are many, many other actors. I think the, the call for nuance is very important. Um, both in terms of nuance, how do we understand money and what is the linkage between money and effectiveness and operational capability and, and meaningful uh, international, global international cooperation. And then to see what are, in fact, some of the agility necessary that smaller organizations offer that, offer, that work with a much smaller budget, but nevertheless have all the agility necessary to solve really important global commons issues. This is why we need to reflect on the, the overall actor makeup, of course, which is according to the official figures of the Canton. Um, 39 international organizations, 461 non-governmental organizations, and 181 government representations that are based here in Geneva. And part of the overall total uh, funding of International Geneva would also, of course, include all the budgets of the NGOs, as well as all the, all the investment by governments that it takes for them to uh, maintain representations in Geneva. Uh, which, if you speak to diplomats here, having, having a mission in Geneva with 50 staff also costs money. Uh, and that is, that is part of the picture that we have currently not calculated, but an intelligent guess might be that the total figure goes a couple of billion more. At the moment, I would not venture out to give a more, uh, more, more precise uh, um, estimate. So if we then look at this, take the, the bottom line figure of the 23.6 billion that, uh, that the report suggests for 2020 as a baseline figure of this is the kind of money that, uh, that, makes, that enables the activities in Geneva, and we compare the total 750 million Swiss franc that the Confederation and the Canton and the City of Geneva invest into, into uh, the, 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 the international Geneva in the infrastructure and to make it work, then that is a very interesting comparison because it only represents about 3.2% of the overall budget. Which, which makes this relatively large figure, this very important investment of uh, the three uh, government levels in Switzerland, puts it very much into perspective, I think. And that is a figure uh, that previously has not been, been present. And then uh, one, one uh, reflection that on the issue of diversification and also a reflection on the moment in history we are, of course, living right now. Um, we are living in, the, you mentioned the, the investment of China that, that, has been, that, that have increased in the World Health Organization. But we are also seeing at the, at the very global level a, uh, um, and, uh, a competition of systems. And the UN and the multilateral system as it has grown out of the so-called American century is currently one system of various systems that are providing uh, good, uh, good uh, global governance services. Uh, th we have seen, particularly over the last 10, 15 years, the regional levels have taken much more preponderance of dealing with regional problems. So the, the regionalization of multilateral activity, which is not that much focused on Geneva, New York, or The Hague, or other, other places. Um, plus also the development of, of simply new multilateralisms um, with new alliances. Uh, particularly, uh, there is a new sense of organization in the Asian space. And it harkens back to the questions at the end, Livio, that you mentioned. The fact that not all member states pay into the, the kind of Geneva-based international organizations doesn't mean that they do not pay in other ways for other global governance institutions uh, that, where they might feel to have a, a larger degree of control over how this organization works. Hence. The big question mark with respect to the discussions of the summit of the future mm. is in fact a question if those top donors who maintain not just the 16 organization study but the UN system as such, um, if they would say, well, uh, economic growth patterns have changed. There are now some countries that are much richer and it is really the moment to change the, the key for the assessed contributions. But then what does this mean with respect to the co-ownership 
of those new pay, new funders and the the so, so to speak old funders, and who who how does one go towards a new mechanism to uh, to diplomatically uh, um, operationalize a co-ownership of a multilateral system that is not just controlled by the top donors? Uh, I think, with respect to the discussions on other countries to paying up. Um, that is an important nuance that uh, that will surely be on the on the table of many diplomats, um, as the UN system uh, will have to open up, or otherwise, which is another scenario that at least in some of the dis informal conversations we've had with the Geneva Policy Outlook, otherwise, if there is a an unwillingness of the top donors to give away a degree of control over some parts of the multilateral system, the system itself might become somewhat sidelined and, uh, and uh, la less important in the management of, uh, of global governance challenges, and the top donors might remain the full control of the system that they, that they pay for, but overall that system becomes less relevant. Mm -hmm. And that is a real, a real strategic uh, challenge of the moment as we are thinking about the question, not just the, the future of UN multilateralism, but the much bigger question of what is, the, what is the multilateralism we need to address the future that we, where, where we need to solve problems. These are my, my reflections. There's much more to say, but I'm sure uh, you have also a lot to say. So it's it's time for for some dis from some uh, discussion. Thank you very much for being here, and for Thank showing you. your interest in the report. I suggest leave you that you join us on stage, so that uh, if you have any specific questions from uh, the report itself. So we have a microphone in uh, the room, and uh, I invite you to briefly introduce yourself. And are um, oh, you sitting here? Okay, so I can sit. Thanks. Um, and uh, to have brief questions, we'll take a couple uh, at the time. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Cécile Molinier, former uh, senior official at the UN and particularly interested in the topic. Congratulations on your presentation, which was uh, extremely interesting. Uh, Professor Carbonier has stolen a lot of my thunder, actually. My, my main question was going to be about the fact that, in particular in the humanitarian sector, most of the money is actually spent in the field for operations activities, from looking at your graphs, we get the impression that there has been, at least until 2020, a significant increase in the amounts of money allocated to the humanitarian sector, and yet, from what I hear from colleagues who are still working there, and from what I read, most of the appeals for humanitarian aid are more and more underfunded. So it, it would be very interesting uh, to uh, look more into the divergence, possibly, between the money that is actually being spent here for the functioning of those uh, organizations that you have uh, researched and the amount that is available actually in the field for operations. And another question, I understand of course that uh, the uh, latest data that you had available were from 2022, if I understood uh, correctly. Uh, the graph that you showed with the uh, significant, a very steep increase actually up to 2020, it would have been very interesting to see if 2020 actually marked some sort of a turning point given the global context, uh, the uh, very significant amount spent on the recovery from the pandemic and of course now even more recently the increase in defense funding. I would assume that actually that curve would start going down steeply, but I'd be interested if you have uh, some information on that. Thank you. I'll we'll take another one. We have one in the back, in the middle. Um, thank you for this uh, interesting discussion uh, and presentation. It seems to me that uh, 
the follow-up to the study will have the greatest impact on what the Swiss are doing and what the canton of uh, uh, Geneva and the city of Geneva is doing in support of multilateralism. Are we, the Swiss, uh, paying our, uh, adequately for all the benefits that we get. And uh, of course, this chart that you have uh, doesn't reflect that. We, we rank very low. But then, as someone has pointed out, there's the whole ecosystem of multilateralism, all the organizations that are based here, and the, uh, and the Swiss, of course, support all that. So I think it would be very useful to map out that whole ecosystem and what benefits the Swiss are getting from multilateralism, and are we paying the commensurate share uh, in supporting multilateralism? Of course, we should not replace the U US and others, but we should be paying at least what we're getting out of it and what we hope to get out in the future. Gilles, would you? I'd like to reply to the first question, maybe, and then Livio on the second. I'm sure Livio will have uh, many uh, things to add, but uh, indeed, uh, we might see, uh, you know, after 20 years of steady growth in humanitarian funding, uh, a, a reversal of trend. Now, what the future holds is difficult to say, but let's say uh, uh, what we, we are not overly optimistic uh, because of the constrained environment that you refer to uh, COVID-19, you know, uh, fallouts plus uh, other budgetary priorities and budgetary difficulties, plus uh, a political environment in many uh, countries where, uh, you know, the, the situation is uh, is complex at home as well, and uh, and part of the conversation is well, when we have to do efforts, what do we cut most, and what do we leave? open, and uh, this is uh, certainly uh, a, a major concern. Uh, now, we can also look, as you said, to the level of underfunded, uh, underfunded appeals. What I think is, is interesting is to see that uh, we have a tendency to have not all donors, and again, there is a broad variety of practices among the donors, but we have seen an overall tendency to have more tight earmarked funding for certain uh, context crises and causes, and uh, this again constrains a bit the ability of an organization that is impartial to uh, give priority to where the needs are most acute and most intense, uh, trying to adapt and what we really enjoy is still a number uh, of donors that provide us with what we call good quality money because it's it's a you know it's a relation of trust where part of the money is only marked and we can really fund uh, what other would call neglected crises or crises that are not every day in the media and uh, I think this is also a very important conversation which relates more to trust uh, between uh, donors and international organizations. And the final point, maybe with the diversification, we see a diversification uh, you know, over the past very few years with uh, generous donations from uh, emerging or new donors, whatever, or re-emerging donors. Um, and, and it's quite important, uh, and it has to be sustained. But uh, what we have seen, and I'm sure, Akim, you have uh, uh, witnessed this a lot. It, it was especially in the humanitarian world a tendency of uh, non-Western donors sometimes to favor government to government direct uh, support. Uh, that is not, you know, uh, uh, always um, aligned with OECD, DAC, or, or humanitarian principles. But it's, but it's, you know, really this uh, more bilateral uh, uh, support. And and the, there there is a question of how, you know, we can really engage because I think what we all want at the end of the day is people who need assistance being assisted, people who need to be protected, that they are effectively protected. And if it goes via different channels, is uh, certainly having an influence, but even if it goes you know, through government to government assistance, it's important that through such engagement, <clears throat> the impact supports the universal objectives that we have to uphold international law. Okay. Um, on what happens after 2020? 
uh, in my head, what I'm thinking is mostly, you know, there. It's about multi-causality. You have COVID, you have the pandemic, you have Joe Biden, uh, you have Russia, uh, now you have Gaza. So whatever is happening, it's going to be very hard to ascribe back to a factor. Uh, my my impression from looking at the trends is that they're going to remain the same. <laughs> Uh, if we look the um, if we look the the donations we saw U.S. donations to the end they, they increased a little bit in the last few years. Uh, of course, is it Biden? Is it not? But uh, we're gonna have to unpack the data we have is up to 2020. Now in July we probably can get data up to 2023. Uh, it's going to be very hard to unpack what it is, but uh, it could be all directions. The second point is on Switzerland. Uh, yes, uh, could, we could do more. But I also think that if we look at the other countries around Switzerland donating that share, you know, it's Italy, it's France, uh, we might be doing more than our size, uh, in a way, for, uh, of approaching that from the economic perspective. Uh, so it's always a bit of a what is the factor we take to, to, to compare. The last point on the appeals, uh, I'm quite excited because the, the Greta is putting together a center on digital humanities. They're going to digitize a lot of data uh, from, from organizations along the last few centuries, and there's going to be archival material to unravel financing a long time that is quite unique. Uh, but me as a person that likes interviews and archives, I think this is something that can be very, very much impact once you start talking to people getting this money. I think we have time for one, two short questions. Yeah. Hello, my name is Hélène Piaget. Thank you very much for the presentation and the painful work that went into the data mining. Um, reflecting on Achim's phrase of this is a moment in history, um, everyone being concerned about diversification, um, I have a question at the macro level, and that is, to what degree can Geneva diver diversify itself, distinguish itself from Switzerland um, as a state, uh, given the voting record at the Security Council and the apparent alignment to uh, so tightly with Brussels and Washington, given this uh, moment in history. And if one's looking at diversification, you know, how does the global majority look at Switzerland and then Geneva um, as a result? Thank you. And maybe last question just in front of you. Uh, I'm Jeremy Farrell from the Australian National University. Um, I was really struck by your slides. Uh, each one of them tells infinite stories. Um, but the one that really jumped out at me was the humanitarian funding uh, slide, and in particular how little funding there is in the public sector towards the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, and then in the private sector there's zero. And I'm just wondering what accounts for this, given that it's surely a significant um, office in the Geneva suite of, as you framed it, humanitarian um, organisations. Thank you. Who want to start? Let me perhaps uh, kick off with a with a reflection on your on your, on your question on the relationship between Swiss foreign policy and international Geneva. I think what the study very clearly shows is that Geneva is much 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 bigger than Swiss foreign policy, um, and uh, and that Geneva is really reflective of a global hub. Um, you have a certain certain a certain character of top donors. But nevertheless, it is one of the few global cities where nearly every, um, every state is represented. And beyond that, where you still have a genuine space to speak across institution and sector. Because in addition to all the governmental and I.O. world, you also have very potent and very important actors in the, in the private sector who are, who are present. This is, of course, a study that the Fondation pour Genève has done, which is more on, the, on, the, on the, also the private sector part of the global footprint of, of Geneva, not just the public sector footprint of Geneva that we have studied here, and this has to be taken into consideration. So I think the, 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 there are political tendencies in Switzerland and many, many of the neighbors around Switzerland and in Europe and in the world. Um, of course, the, the, the reflection on vulnerability that has been mentioned uh, with respect to 
having uh, having 75 percent of the funding of these uh, these 16 organizations come from from 15 entities that are primarily uh, Western Western governments. Um, you have 25 percent on the UN United States of America. With elections coming up, very important elections coming up in the U.S. in, in, in November, this of course leaves one to to reflect on what is what we can do now, in order to assure a, a footprint for very concrete global governance that is in fact proactive and that is effectful in in working on global governance challenges and and global commons challenges, while also understanding that, uh, of course, we won't save the world only from Geneva. Uh, there are other centers out there, uh, be that Gulf countries that have become much more active on certain dossiers. There, are, there is a whole diversification of where global mobilization is taking place and connecting Geneva much better to these other global hubs of global coordination. I think that is going to be a front line for activity, not just for, for governmental representatives, but also all those actors who represent this tremendous diversity. Uh, of what is uh, the, the uh, Genève Hub Global. Maybe Livio, Gianluca, maybe last final comments? I'll just take your question very quickly. If, from the top of my head, I don't have any good answer, uh, but uh, it gets me back to what Gianluca said about mandates, right? Um, OSHR probably has a more normative mandate than UNHCR. They're doing very different things at the ground. I would. I would hypothesize, but I need to figure it out. <laughs> There's a lot in there that we could not humanly unpack. We have a lot to say. I have a lot to say about shine as well uh, that we did in the longer report, but yeah. another time. Come back. And jump. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is only the first step. <laughs> yes. Just one quick comment, because I think we are out of time. Uh, on the, uh, what Akim was saying, diversification uh, of funding uh, can lead to a loss of control by the big traditional donors. It is true, and it is definitely uh, one of the considerations. But we have to be careful to equate control in the sense of influence just with the amount of money you give. And if you look, again, I keep referring to WHO, the organization, I know best, Brazil, which is not a big donor, and I think it pays 2% of assessed contribution, has an incredible influence. And so it's not only the amount of money, but it's a clarity of the political agenda, it's a quality of diplomatic service, it's the ability to build alliances that can lead countries with a sort of um, relatively small financial footprint to have quite some influence. The Gulf countries are the same, but now they really have quite an influence also precipitated by the crisis in Gaza. But if you look at the amount of sheer, total absolute amount of money they give is totally disproportionate in, in a negative sense to the, uh, to, to, to the political political uh, influence. And the underfunding, obviously, uh, for human rights, I mean, it's very anecdotal, but if you think of it, why would you want to overfund an office that can act as a watchdog and come to judge what you're doing, send these pesky special rapporteurs? Um, so I mean, the same, I think, in the, um, the work of WHO on non-communicable diseases, they kill 70 out of 100 people every year. They are the real killers. And it's totally underfunded. Why? Because the um, economic and industrial interest behind. It's tobacco, <clears throat> it's alcohol, it's junk food, ultra-processed food. Uh, why would... So the, these are big lobbies that basically tell the governments, don't give too much money to these pesky people in WHO that you know basically create reputation that is and so on. So there are fairly sometimes evident reasons for underfunding. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we arrive at the end of our event. I would like to thank our great panelists today, our two co-authors of the study, uh, the Republican State of Geneva, of course, for their support, and all of you for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to continue this discussion. I think there is a lot of uh, food for thoughts that came out from this discussion today. And uh, if you haven't done so yet, I invite you to have a look at the full report, which is available on the Geneva Graduate Institute uh, webpage. Have a nice afternoon and thank you very much. Thank you.